All right, guys, welcome back to the Hunter's Quest podcast. It's great to be with you. This is your host, Hunter McWaters, and um, today I have an awesome guest who is like a legendary elk caller, elk hunter, um, and uh, just a really awesome dude. Corey Jacobson is my guest this week. Um, I've been wanting to talk to Corey for a while, but just hadn't had an opportunity or um, just the right time, but I was able to uh, meet Corey um, this year um, at the Western Hunt Expo in Salt Lake City, and uh, really great guy, very friendly dude, uh, Christian guy, and um, I invited him on the podcast, and we made it happen, and the other reason I wanted to get him on was, um, as I've made known before, my goal for 2023 was to kill my first elk, and um, I have been extremely blessed. I drew not only a Montana general elk tag, but I also drew a very good New Mexico muzzleloader elk tag that I'm very excited about. Um, so I, I did not know that at the time of recording this episode. Um, this was before I drew those tags, but I, I knew that was my goal coming into the season, and it would be likely that I would draw at least the one tag. So... Um, so I had Corey on to talk about elk hunting and kind of elk 101, which is his specialty. So, um, you know, we go through some um, high level general tips and tactics on killing elk and uh, we get into a few other things in the episode, but the main thrust is um, how to kill your first elk. So I um, hope you guys enjoy this episode. I think there's good info in here, even if you've got a few elk under your, under your belt. Um, but it's uh, a great episode with a really great guest. So hope you guys enjoy it. If you have not yet, please go subscribe to my YouTube channel. Just search Hunter McWaters. Um, you can also find me on Instagram at the Hunter's Quest. And if you could, please share this podcast. Leave me a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. Um, and all those all those things help. If you do leave me a written review, I'll send you a I'll give you a shout out on the show, and I'll send you some swag in the mail. And, um, you know, I hope you guys are ready for elk season. Um, not exactly sure when I'll release this episode, but I'm planning to hold off to release it a little closer to elk season. Um, and so I hope you guys are ready to get out there and enjoy. And, uh, you know, Lord willing, uh, fill in some tags. Hopefully I will be myself. Um, but enjoy this episode with Corey Jacobson and have a great day. All right, guys, welcome to the Hunter's Quest podcast. This is your host, Hunter McWaters. Good to be with you guys. And um, today I'm with Corey Jacobson. How you doing, brother? I'm doing great. How are you? Good, man. Just uh, living the life, plugging away. I think you said you're in the middle of doing some editing and stuff like that. So we're kind of in the same boat, I think. You're working on uh, Destination Elk. Is it season five, right? Season five, yeah. We're uh, down to the last episode. We're... Okay. Putting the, putting the final touches on it and getting it ready here. Cool. And then probably uh, in the thick of, do you mainly, do you hunt in multiple states or do you, are you sticking around your home state usually or how does that pan out usually? Usually travel for uh, one elk hunt, you know, we'll hunt Idaho, which is where I live and then uh, try to go on one out of state hunt a year. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you, you uh, Idaho residents are lucky. You, you don't have to travel too much. It doesn't, doesn't seem like. Yeah, no, and it's, uh, we're, we're pretty fortunate as residents, you know, non-residents used to be about as fortunate as we were here, but they're starting, I think everywhere, all states are starting to realize, hey, we've got to protect our residents and start cutting yeah. back on what we're giving non-residents. But mm -hmm. yeah, we can, uh, we can just go down to the Walmart and buy an elk tag, yeah. a deer tag, a bear tag, a mountain lion tag, wolf tags, turkey tags. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's a pretty good, pretty good deal. No, that's cool, man. Um, yeah, I, uh, I'm fairly new to the Western hunting game. So I think, um, in a lot of ways I'm lucky that I don't know what it used to be like, <laughs> <laughs> but for me, you know, it seems like if you, you know, if you're working multiple States and you kind of, I mean, it's, it's a brain teaser. You gotta like, like if this happens then this happens, but if this doesn't, then I can apply for, it's definitely like a teaser, a brain, you know, without using an expletive, it's, um, it makes your brain explode. But, um, 
But you can get tags if you work the system and work to multiple states and have a strategy. So absolutely, yeah. yep. Well, anyway, man, um, we met this year at the expo. It was actually at uh, Airbnb after the expo, but <laughs> basically at the expo. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, you've been on my radar for a while, um, but I just figured since we finally met in person, it'd be a good time to ask for some of your time. So I appreciate it, man. Absolutely. No, it's uh, it's an honor to to be here and chat with you. I'm uh, always open to chatting about hunting and elk yeah. hunting and Western hunting and anything else. Cool. Well, kind of the way I want to frame the conversation is, is so I've been doing Western hunting for, I guess this will be my fourth season coming up. So pretty new, um, but I've been very fortunate to learn from some really great hunters and been able to kind of dive in really with both feet and i've learned a lot in a short amount of time but i still have not killed my first elk yet so <laughs> you're a great guest because my goal this year is to kill my first elk so excellent yeah so i want to jump into that but first i just do want to hear a little bit about your background even though a lot of my listeners may already know a lot about you just i personally don't know a ton about you so i'd love to hear just kind of a little bit about your background um and uh, just your early years and getting into hunting and all that kind of stuff. You don't go super in detail, but just some, for some context. Yeah, for sure. No, I uh, I grew up in Idaho, uh, central Idaho, during the absolute heyday of, of elk populations in Idaho. So, okay. you know, I, I started hunting in the mid to late 80s and hunted through the mid to late 90s, which I think that time period, especially in Idaho, was absolutely the heyday. So I grew up a little tiny settlement community. It wasn't even a town. We didn't have a gas station. Wow. Uh, the closest gas station was about 20 miles away. Um, so you had to went, plan ahead. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. We uh, went to a little one room schoolhouse, uh, wow. had one, one teacher first through sixth grades, 15, 16 kids in the whole school. Wow. Uh, so very uh, different. Uh, upbringing, but what that yeah. allowed was I was able to bow hunt out my back door every day after school. You know, it, it literally we had deer and elk, uh, mountain lions, bears, everything in our backyard. Mm. And so I grew up, you know, that was, that was life. We had no internet back then. We didn't, we had, we had television, but we got one channel and that's because my dad ran an antenna uh, up at the top of the tallest oh, no tree way. on our property to pick up the news from uh, several miles away. But uh, every, every minute was spent outdoors. And okay. my dad was a, an outfitter and a guide. Uh, so just, you know, I, I came across it naturally and cut my teeth like i said during during prime time when when elk hunting was absolutely incredible um, now let me just jump in right there so i'm assuming that you're making the distinction between the prime time is is wolves the the reason why it's not <laughs> like that anymore is that the reason or is it other factors or is that a combination or yeah there there's just a combination you know the elk up there got hit really hard in the uh, winter of 96 with uh super hard and late spring uh killed a, a lot of elk and mm. in 95 that's when the wolves were reintroduced um they were you know it took them five six seven years to really start causing damage um habitat loss you know fire there was just a, a everything it was a perfect storm mm. that we went from having incredible elk numbers in that area to our fish and game agency not even doing flights to count elk uh wow. in the recent years so you know i i was fortunate that i got to experience that but at the same time i've also got to experience what it's like to to hunt tough public land over the counter elk hunting yeah yeah man so have you I know everyone makes a big deal of the wolves. Do you think that really is a, a really big, uh, one of the big factors in that, or you think it's kind of just, just another thing in the storm? Uh, I would say, I don't want to say it's the, the major factor, but it is right up there. Yeah, for okay. sure. Um, between, you know, the wolves, they came in and here's this 
uh, target rich environment for them yeah. of all of these elk populations surpassing objection, you know, everything. It was just, uh, it was a perfect storm. And so the wolves come in, they've got all this feed, they flourish, uh, the elk numbers drop, then you get a hard winter that hits, uh, you get fires that come through. So elk migrate for winter and don't come back into the traditional summer grounds yeah. are concentrated. Now the wolves are able to pick off this lower number of elk because they're concentrated. And so it's, you know, wolves are definitely, they, they hammer the populations, but I think even more than that, they change the, the patterns of the elk. They, the elk mm. are continually moving now. They found out that the closer they get to civilization, the safer they are because mm. wolves aren't going to venture into people's backyards quite as much. So now you have elk that are just living year round on private land. So they're not accessible for public land hunting. Um, so, you know, public land hunter goes out and he comes back and says, there are no elk. The wolves killed them all. Well, they killed a lot of them, but they changed the habits of the ones that are left. They're either not coming back into that area or they're moving through that area once every seven days and trying to stay ahead of the wolves and continually moving. So that makes sense. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not like the wolves have wiped out all the elk, but the wolves have changed the landscape for elk hunting for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I did some, I did some hunting in Idaho this year and um, we were in an area that supposedly at one point was very thick with elk, very good elk hunting. Um, and we saw one elk like five miles away and we had like fresh wolf tracks, like 50 feet from our tent, like every morning. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but I can see that. And, uh, so anyway, um, well, that's cool. So you grew up, um, hunting kind of right up out your back door. Um, when did that kind of transition or how did that kind of transition into doing some of the kind of stuff you're doing now in terms of the elk calling, you know, com competitive side, and then also kind of getting into content creation and all that kind of good stuff. You know, it's just, uh, I, I never had a plan for any of it. I'm just, uh, I grew up like, like everybody else, you know, just a young kid that loved the outdoors and had a dream of, you know, whether it was, I, I remember I went through a phase of wanting to own a sporting goods store. I just, I mm. wanted to be in hunting. That's what I love to do. And I wanted to make a, a job of it, but uh, I got a degree in mechanical engineering and that oh, took me cool. to, took me to the city and uh, a nine to five job and, you know, the 401k and the good time off and all of that. And I realized after 10 years, well, I realized from the beginning, but after 10 years, I said, <laughs> this isn't what I want. This, this is not, you know, I'm getting plenty of vacation time to go out. I've got a good paycheck that I can count on every two weeks, but uh, this isn't fulfilling for me. Yeah. And I knew, you know, I wanted to spend time in the outdoors, but you can't just you know, there, there's, it's not like there's a, a livelihood in the hunting industry. You've got to, you've got to find something. So yep. I grew up, uh, you know, I can remember my first elk call diaphragm elk call was Larry D Jones. It was probably 1984, somewhere in there. And, uh, we, they had little town elk calling contests and I okay. entered it and did well. And it just, it grew. My dad was involved with Rocky mountain elk foundation from the beginning and they started having a, a world championship. And so I went to that a few times in uh, high school and then really got after it in college and actually won a uh, world elk calling championship. I think when I was 19 uh, and then entered the pro division the next year and, and won in the pro division. And so that was kind of my door that opened the hunting industry that mm -hmm. now I had a, a niche. Now I had uh, a title and I could, you know, do seminars and teach people how to call elk. And For sure. at the time, I think I won my first world elk calling championship before I had actually killed an elk. So, <laughs> you know, when people talk about the average is 10% you know, or whatever. I fit right into that. I hunted elk with a bow for nine years before I killed an elk. Wow. And, uh, you know, fortunately I, I learned a lot through the failures of those first nine years. Yeah. And once I got it down, you know, it was like, and I think a lot of people are the same. Once you kill your first elk, it's the light bulb comes on, things click. And so it's tough to get to that first one, but once you get that first one, uh, it gets easier. It never gets easy, but it gets easier. Right. And, yeah, and I mean, I feel like a lot of times you learn more from, in some ways, you learn more from an unsuccessful hunt than 
when you actually kill something a lot of times. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's probably the most important takeaway for a, a new elk hunter is be prepared to fail, but don't just accept failure, you know, learn from it. There's so much that can be learned from failing and we fail way more on an elk hunt than we succeed. You know, success is uh, at the end of the day, one shot, you kill an elk and you pack it out. But there's 99 opportunities where things don't work out and you learn from that. And those are so important. The, the getting a shot and doing things right, there's very little that can be learned from that. But it's yeah. all of the failures up to that that are so critical to, to pay attention to, to understand what went wrong, to analyze what went wrong and then fix it. Absolutely. And if somebody's able to do that, uh, that learning curve and that success curve comes a lot quicker. Yeah, I, I feel like when you kill something, it's like, it's just like, you only focus on that, and you're like celebrating that, and you just kind of like, just disregard the rest in a way, yep. um, and you're just kind of like reveling in that success, and you're not really breaking things down, whereas when like, when you're, you know, driving home, and you're munching on tag soup the whole way home, <laughs> you're just analyzing everything you could have done differently what you did right what you did wrong and i think you just learn a ton from that absolutely yeah there, there's no better teacher than failure for sure but <laughs> the problem is is a lot of people do dwell on just the outcome just the success or the failure and don't take time to break things down and say what did i do wrong you know yeah. they don't understand uh, and it's hard, you know, somebody coming from back east, they don't get to live with elk year round. They don't get that opportunity to educate themselves on elk behavior. They get a seven day period in September, or October, they come out, they dive into it and it's a whirlwind. And before they know it, it's over. And they're like, what just happened? I didn't even see an elk. I didn't hear an elk bugle. Why couldn't yeah. I find elk, you know? And so it's, it is difficult. For sure, man. Um, all right. So I want to finish a little bit, uh, kind of your, your, your origin story and then i want to jump in here so but so you're you're working at um an engineering firm is that correct yep and um realizing this isn't what you want to do and, and that's kind of when you start winning some of these competitions you're winning them way before that but you were getting i guess maybe more no notoriety in that kind of space and then is that kind of how you were able to kind of take the jump out of your the security of the nine to five job yeah. And so I started a construction company, actually. Okay. Um, you know, there's there's very little money. I get emails almost daily from people. How do I make the jump from my job as an accountant <laughs> or as an engineer or in construction to the hunting industry? And there are definitely hunting companies that will hire, you know, customer service people or marketing right. if you've got marketing experience and things. But Usually that's, at the end of the day, that's just another nine to five. It is. You know. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're working for someone else. At least you're in yeah. an industry you like, and you're, right. you're talking with like-minded people, but you're still working for someone. Mm -hmm. So taking that leap and starting your own business, you've got to have, you've got to have a foundation there. I mean, there's got to be something for me, it was elk calling and I spent, you know, 10, 12 years building that up. And, you know, I started a website during that time. It was more just a blog of sharing my experiences and, and things that I had learned about elk hunting. Uh, and at the end of the day, you know, looking back, what I really loved was seeing other people be successful because I knew what was coming as far as the attacks on our ability to hunt elk, you know, whether it was habitat loss, whether it was state regulations, you know, all the things that we're seeing now uh, I foresaw that and I thought this is, I've got little, little kids that I want to make sure that they have hunting in the future. And if I just go out and hunt and keep everything to myself, it's going to be me standing there fighting when these things come. If yeah. I can build a community of people that are passionate about elk and about elk hunting, we can band together and we can, we can protect this. And Will Primos, I was talking to him one time and he said something that absolutely is at the core of what I believe. And he said, if you teach someone to love something, they're going to protect it. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, that's kind of been my goal of getting into, you know, Elk 101 is the website I started, but it's really a platform to bring elk hunters together to create a passion, whether it's through hunting success, uh, habitat, access, you know, all these different things that are so important. I just realized the value of having a community and having people banded together for that common cause and that common goal 
because it's not guaranteed that we're going to have elk to hunt tomorrow, that we're going to have elk seasons to, to enjoy tomorrow. We've got to fight for that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure, man. Um, yeah. And that's like what you said that, uh, Will Primo said to you. I mean, that's, that's basically the, the bottom line of the North American conservation model, right? Is, you know, people love these animals. They want to protect the habitats and the animals and preserve for their passion of hunting, you know? Yep. Yeah. And that hunting is management. I mean, that's what I think a lot of people fail. Even hunters sometimes don't recognize the value of what we're doing from a management standpoint. And when we talk about management, we're thinking about tomorrow. You know, we're not, we don't want populations to grow so much that the animals get sick or that they start causing Mm -hmm. a bunch of problems. We don't want the populations to dip so low that now we struggle for years and, you know, hope to rebuild populations. We want to keep them as, as consistent as we can. And hunting is the tool that can be used for that. And we hear the argument all the time, you know, let nature manage nature. And unfortunately, humans have encroached on nature to the point where yeah, nature can't, can't manage nature. Right. We, know, yeah, we we've thrown everything so out of whack that we can't just let it go. We have to control it or else it's just going to like collapse. <laughs> yeah. And it's not, oh, we want to be in control of everything. It's, hey, we've messed things up to the point where if we don't remain active in this management, we're going to lose, you know, not just hunting. Yeah. We aren't talking hunting. We're talking wildlife in general. Mm-hmm. Uh nature's been encroached upon by us and we we have a a responsibility now to actively manage that yeah and the best tool is hunting yeah and i a lot of people especially i mean hunters too but especially like non-hunters don't understand that concept that you that's very important like uh even myself i didn't really understand it until recently but yeah i mean just you take like certain ecosystems where yeah, you, know, you might drive by a stand of trees and like, oh, it's just trees, but they're all a hundred percent invasive species, and you know you don't know it, but just by looking at it. But you know, if we don't, like you say, if we don't manage things, things are to a point where they can't really manage themselves. Totally. Yeah, and, and I'm not just talking hunting and wildlife. I mean, we've got the whole ecology. We've got you know watersheds. We've got logging. Yeah. We've got fires. We've got all these things that are a part of of managing it because nature can't. You know, it used to be, okay, fire goes through, nature causes a fire, it burns through, nobody suppresses it, it goes out when it needs to, restores habitat, you know, there's no logging needed, whatever. That's changed. I mean, right. we're, we're stopping fires because people live in these areas now. Uh, logging has been reduced to the point where we aren't able to manage the, the forest like we need to and the habitat that comes with that, the feed that comes with you know, from that. And so there's just so many moving pieces when it comes to conserving a species like an elk. And, you know, you throw wolves in there and talk about that. Well, if wolves weren't managed, and we saw that for so many years because they were caught up in litigation, wolves weren't managed. So now all of a sudden, elk are suffering from it. And hunting, you know, might have to be shut off to let the elk numbers rebound. And I think, you know, a lot of people, and I'm not saying non-hunters necessarily, but anti-hunters who are just against hunting, they see that as a win. You know, yeah. let the let the wolves kill the elk down to a number so hunting's not needed. Let let nature manage nature. The problem is we saw it in central Idaho, you know, the Lock Saw Selway area, that herd was just absolutely exploding in the early 90s. It was phenomenal up there. And then get wolves in there. And you get that hard winter, you get fires that come through, all of these things. And it's overnight. We're not talking generations and generations. We're talking in a period of five years. Hmm. We went from explosive elk populations to the fish and game not even doing flights to count elk because there weren't enough elk to even count. Jeez. Wow. Yeah, that's crazy, man. Um, I was just thinking it's almost like, you know, almost like you, you could liken it to like, we've kind of and it's sad but it's true we've we've done enough damage to the ecosystem it's almost like a person that requires some type of medication or a device to stay alive and like if you're just like well just let nature run its course and you remove the pacemaker or whatever like they're gonna (laughs) die so uh, it's it's up to us to manage and, and to like you know and to, in a kind way, explain these things to non-hunters, because most people are not anti; they're they're just non, right? Yeah, totally. So if we can if we can get those that seventy percent in the middle, kind of 
to understand the importance of hunting, it's huge. But anyway, that's kind of a rabbit trail, but, um, <laughs> but it's good that we talked about it. Um, so you start your construction company. Take me from there. Yeah. So I started a construction company and what that gave me was freedom. Um, I was no longer tied to an eight to five. I could uh, get up early and work hard and take off at three o'clock and go to my kids basketball games or t-ball games. Uh, I could. How many you know, kids you, you got? I have three. Okay. And uh, they're uh, 20. My number three is on the way. Oh, congrats. Yeah. Kind of I'm, uh, I'm a little ways ahead of you. My youngest <laughs> is 16. So okay. oldest is 20. I've got an 18 year old daughter and then uh, our youngest son is 16. So, okay. you know, that was a lot of motivation for me to to do that. I wanted to be able to coach their t-ball teams and their basketball teams. I wanted to be able to have the freedom to leave work at 11 o'clock and go to a school program and then, yeah. you know, go back to work. And if I need to take off the morning, I can work until eight o'clock at night. And so that, that's what it gave me was that freedom. I mean, it came with a lot of risk and a lot of stress because, you know, that freedom is awesome. But now there's no guarantee of a paycheck. There's right. nobody paying for your insurance. There's no 401ks. You know, there's a lot of a lot of stress that that comes with. And so, mm -hmm. with that freedom, uh, I was able to start doing more seminars and uh, being immersed in the hunting industry. And with the website, you know, now built, um, it started growing. Traffic started growing. It grew into uh, offering seminars. We had an online store. We had a chat forum and it just kept growing and I saw people were hungry for elk hunting information. And if I could provide quality elk hunting information to take somebody that's never been hunting before and get their feet, you know, exposed before they actually stepped foot in it. So they had at least an idea of what to expect. Uh, they were going to fall in love with hunting more. They were going to have a passion for it. They were going to have a better chance of being successful. Yeah. And so that became kind of my focus, still work in construction uh, until I got to a point where there was enough income coming in that I could, again, say, hey, here's the risk. Uh, it's it's going to be stressful for a bit. I'm going to have to work a lot of hours, but I think we can make this work and, and provide a, a revenue stream that supports our family and allows me to do this full time. Nice, man. That's awesome. Um, yeah, I think a lot of people just, they might have some romantic ideas about it or whatever. And sometimes people just want to just jump in like the, you know, but I think it's so important. Like, like you said, like, you know, for me, I was working another full-time job for two years while I started my podcast and, um, and still, you know, stuff is not like set by any means, but, um, I had to, you know, I had to keep that foundation and, and build things over time, you know? So. And I think that if there's, if there's one takeaway for somebody that wants to get into the hunting industry, uh, keep your day job. You've got to work two <laughs> jobs and that means 12, 14 hour days, a lot of days, and yeah. you've got to have a, a supportive spouse, you know, and yeah. you have to make some sacrifices. And yeah. I absolutely made sacrifices. My wife was completely supportive and, you know, those sacrifices we knew would pay off if we worked hard and, and they have, and it's been so great, you know, to be able to coach my kids high school basketball team and just mm -hmm. to have that freedom, you know, we talk about freedom and, you know, somebody will say, well, you get free this from this company. It's like nothing in life is free. Right. You know, there, you have earned it. You, you have to provide something in exchange for them. Sure. And it's taken 15 years to build a platform that provides that, that value for a, a partner. Um, yeah. So that, that freedom, you know, comes with a lot of work, but it's never, you don't get to a point where it's like, oh, I've made it. Now I can just sit back and, and, you know, reap the benefits of all this hard work. It's still, it seems like the snowball just gets bigger and gets rolling down the hill. And that means you've got to work a lot harder to control the direction it's going. And yeah. So one thing I didn't ask about when you're talking about growing up and stuff, which I just wanted to hit on real quick, um, was, you know, was, church or spirituality religion ever kind of part of your growing up absolutely yeah. yeah no it is and i think just uh, uh an understanding you know of of creation and mm -hmm. that we've got a responsibility to to be stewards of the land and the wildlife you know that's yeah. that's a big part of it and then just understanding you know 
God put us here for a reason and family's important. And, yeah. you know, it, it's, it's important, I think, to, to stay balanced in everything. And I see a lot of people that, you know, just really focus on one thing, whether that's golf or hunting or whatever, yeah. and that becomes their, their focus. And, uh, for me, I think just, uh, being a Christian and, and understanding, um, there's more purpose to life than just taking from, from uh, the resources here. It's, yeah. it's important to give back. It's important to manage responsibly. So yeah, yeah it's, it's been a, been a very important part of growing up in my life. Cool, man. Yeah. And for me, like you probably would say, I, well, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you know, I'm, I'm a, a Christian as well. And just looking back at all the things that, you know, I went through in life, um, that maybe in the moment it's like, why God are you doing this? Why am I going through this? You know, but like looking back is like everything was orchestrated. Um, and it feels like I'm right where I need to be at this time with the skills that I, you know, have picked up along the way that I felt like God just kind of wove it all together to, to make this happen. Have you felt like that yourself? Oh, totally. Yeah. And I think, you know, we're, when we understand that we're put here on the earth to, uh, to be tested and to, to grow, you know, there's so much overlap between uh, spirituality and hard work and hunting. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think just having that, um, I don't know, just that, that vision of, hey, I'm here, to, I'm, I'm going to fail but yeah. I can learn from my failures. I can, I can, uh, my failure doesn't define me, you know, whether that's sure. in religion, whether that's in life, whether that's in hunting, you yeah. know, there's just, there's so much that can be learned about life from hunting. And yeah. there's so much, you know, that, that having a foundation in, uh, in religion that can give us perspective that, yeah. you know, my, my failure on this hunt isn't the end of the world. I can pick up and, and learn from that and move forward and be stronger and be better from it for sure. Yeah. yeah that's perfect. I mean, it's, it, I've said this before, but it's like, um, you know, if you have that foundation of a relationship with God and, um, it's like, it gives you the freedom to know that you can fail, but you will not utterly fail. Like if you yeah. have that faith, like God's got me, it gives you the freedom to take that step, start that construction company or, you know, take that step of going full into the hunting industry or whatever it may be, because yeah, it's still scary. It's still a risk. But if you kind of come into that with a base level belief that even if it doesn't work out, God still got me it just allows you to take more risk and to learn more and to grow more and ultimately have a more full life. Totally. And that's, I mean, that's the definition of faith, you know, stepping out of the light into the darkness. It's, mm -hmm. you, we can stand, you know, a ship can sit in the Harbor its whole life and be brand new, you know, 50 years later, but yeah. that's not what ships are made for. They're made to go out and experience some turbulent waters and, yep. and uh, that's us for sure. And we can't Absolutely. just, we can't just sit there and, and bask in comfort. We've got to stretch ourselves a little bit and take some risks. But with that being said, they can't be blind risks. You know, yeah. they can't, they've, they've got to be calculated. And I'm an For engineer. Sure. I, I think very analytically. And mm -hmm. so I calculate those risks. I'm like, what's the worst that could happen? What, what's the best possible outcome and what's real, you know, what's the realistic outcome here. And so I'm looking at it going worst case, yeah, we're going to be fine. It's going to be a headache. It's going to be a mess for a while. Yeah. But if I understand that that's potential, that could happen, it it kind of minimizes the the fear a little bit. There's still yeah. absolutely fear and stress. I had a really good friend that when I was leaving uh, engineering world to start construction, you know, I was having to go out and, and take out construction loans in my own personal name. And if things didn't work out, that's a huge, right. huge amount of risk. And he, uh, he was asking me before, he's like, well, what, what are you feeling? And I said, you know, I'm, I'm scared. You know, there's a lot of fear here. And he's like, good. He's like, I would tell you not to do it if you weren't scared because yeah. fear can be the greatest motivator you'll ever, ever experience. Yeah. And you know, that fear is every day I'd come home and I'm like, I don't have a guaranteed paycheck in two weeks. I've got three little mouths here waiting to be fed. And my wife, you know, having full faith in what I'm doing and supporting me a hundred percent 
I need to make sure that, that they're taken care of and that they're confident in my ability to take care of them. Yeah. And that just pushed me to get up earlier and to work harder and, and make things work. Nice. Yeah. And then ultimately fear or like courage is not the absence of fear. It's what you do in the face of that fear. Do you continue or do you cave? Yep. Because even the bravest people on the earth are scared, but they just keep going anyway. <laughs> totally. Yep. Um, that's awesome. I, that's something like that has been um, resonating a lot with me lately, and uh, I feel like I kind of learned that recently. But, but yeah, man, um, that's great, man. Um, let's uh, let's transition here a little bit. Um, I'd love for we only have about thirty minutes left, but maybe like a little uh, Elk One Hundred One crash course here. Um, <laughs> Um, but yeah, seriously, I mean, I think a lot of my audience might be in the same boat as me and, and just, uh, maybe heading out on their first elk hunting this year or planning on it. Um, and, uh, you know, when you go out from my, you know, from my perspective, when you go out on a, a mule deer hunt or a coos deer hunt, um, it's all very new, but at the same time, there's still deer, right? Um, you know, they still kind of rut in November and act like deer, not to say there's not a whole lot of learning curve there, but I mean, elk are a completely different animal, different herd dynamics, different, you know, vocalizations, different breeding times, just everything. So, um, I'd love to just kind of, and this, maybe this is too broad of a question, but <laughs> I don't know, but maybe, you know, like if you were just, just kind of starting off giving advice to a new elk hunter, I should Lord willing, draw a montana general tag this year hopefully um and if that does happen um i'm gonna go in september and if it doesn't work out in september i'm gonna go back you know maybe in october um so anyway um i don't know is that yeah. too broad or can you no can you just, i, I like, think go? we can we, we can <laughs> weave a, a conversation out of that for sure i think yeah. you know like you said the the first step is I think everybody dreams of going on an elk hunt, you know, whether they live in the West or the East or, you know, internationally elk yeah. are just, there, there's an allure to not only the, the train and the habitat they live in, but just to the animal itself. Yeah. And they're a majestic creature for there's sure. There's nothing like it. I, yeah. I, I've been on um, an elk hunt where I was actually filming for Dan from elk shape. And when the first time we got into bow range, of an elk a bull and it was screaming i was i was like yeah, okay now i understand why people get obsessed with this i mean it is like it's like otherworldly it's like yeah. the atmosphere changes it's like it's we it's a crazy feeling it is they're just they're so loud and powerful when they yeah. vocalize and i mean that's i i really think that's what separates elk from every other animal is not only its vocalizations but your ability to interact vocally with it. Mm. And for me being an elk caller, you know, that that's my platform. Um, that's my passion. That, that is why I love hunting elk is because I can talk to them, Yeah, you know, that's and it's, cool. it's, it's not that simple, but at, at the same time, they use vocalization to communicate with each other. And if you're able to insert yourself uh, into a conversation with them, mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty amazing. And so, They've got big antlers. They're huge body. The meat is delicious. They bugle. <laughs> they live in some of the most beautiful country that you can imagine. So they are like the pinnacle animal to, yeah. to be able to hunt, especially in the West. So I think the first step is everybody dreams of it. There's no better time than right now to go. So, mm -hmm. you know, for the people that are sitting on the fence saying, I'm going to go someday, make, make someday happen sooner yeah. than later you know don't don't sit there and wait and wait until you're you know randy newberg always said you're going to run out of health before you run out of money mm -hmm. um and so it's important to go while you're healthy because elk don't live in an area where when you're you know <laughs> 70 years old and you want to go on your first elk hunt and you're right you're, you know you're out of shape you know whatever it just becomes a lot more difficult so sure. um that's the first step commit to going on an elk hunt and don't worry about all of the scary things, all the unknown that's, that's available and you can learn enough to go and be confident. And so from there, that's honestly what elk 101 was, was put in place to do is shorten the learning curve, uh, lower the hurdles, 
provide the information in an easy to understand format. So somebody who's never hunted elk before can dive in and at the end of, you know, their, their research say, I've got a handle on this, this, yeah. you know, I'm confident enough to go and have a good time rather than to show up and be like, this is so overwhelming. I don't even know where to start. This is worse than a needle in a haystack because I'm at 10,000 feet. I've got altitude sickness yeah. and can't get out of my tent and it's snowing and cold and I wasn't prepared for this. I'm going to you know, throw in the towel and head home, which yeah. happens so much when you aren't prepared. Yeah. Well, okay. So, you know, like I said, we don't have a ton of time and this is like, <laughs> this is like 10 podcasts worth of stuff. So we're going to keep it very 10,000 foot level. Yep. Um, but let's, let's just kind of go down. So let's take this from like, from my perspective, from somebody who's not in the West. So let's say I get my tag. Um, and again, keeping it very 10,000 foot level, um, starting out with, with e-scouting from a very basic perspective, what are kind of some of the areas you're going to start to at least focus in or look for to kind of just start to narrow down what you're looking for in terms of areas? Totally. So you've got a tag, you know, the general area you're going to go um, as far as the unit or whatever. So from there, uh, e-scouting has come a long way. It used to mm -hmm. be a map and you're looking at it going, well, there's a road here and it looks like <laughs> this is facing north, you know, just it was so difficult, but it was still possible then. Now it's just 3D and you can highlight elevations and aspects and all these things. So what I look for is elk have three primary needs. They've got to have food, they've got to have water, and they've got to have protection, sanctuary, safety, whatever you know you want to call it. Um, and for an elk, especially in September, they're going to find that sanctuary on north faces. So mm. a hillside that faces north is going to be cooler which in September, you know, an elk staying cool is important. Uh, it's going to be the thicker part because of the, the aspect of it. More vegetation is going to grow there, providing them with more cover. So when I'm e-scouting, I'm looking for north faces where an elk can bed, where it's going to spend literally almost all day just hanging out in its yeah. bedding area. Uh, what I found is, you know, in the mountains in the, in the west, Elk are usually, they're going to use the mountains. We can talk about that in just a second, but they're going to use the mountain and they're going to use it uh, in a way that provides them with the most chance of survival, but they're usually going to bed somewhere up on the mountain, whether it's halfway, three quarters of the way, at some point up on that north face. And so they're going to probably be looking for a bench or some kind of a, a little mm -hmm. flat area on that mountain. And thermals are coming up. We can talk about thermals in a minute because it's probably the most under uh, studied and underappreciated fact of, of hunting elk in the West, but uh, they're going to, sure. the, the thermals are coming up the mountain during the day. So they're going to be able to smell danger below them, but they're going to be exposed above them. So that means they're going to probably bed somewhere where it's either wide open above them and they can sit and look and use mm -hmm. their eyes, or it's going to be so thick that nothing can get through it. Not even a mountain lion can get through it without making noise, you know, that yeah. kind of thickness. So that really helps me pinpoint just knowing those few little factors. I can really pinpoint really, uh, I don't know, I guess there's a high, high chance that an elk is going to use that area as a bedding area. So yeah. I'm looking north face up a mountain, find a flat bench with either wide open hills above it or super thick vegetation above it. So cool. that's first, that's so bedding you area. Might, you might like look for a place where there's a camping area, a camp, you know, camp spot somewhere nearby, and then maybe like a east-west ridge line where you've got tons of access to all kinds of north. You can kind of run that ridge and, and, hit and just kind of call into the different drainages and stuff, huh? Totally. Yep, an east-west ridge line that provides a whole bunch of north faces gives you more opportunity to to find an elk in its bedding cool. area so cool. the other thing they need is feed and cows are the leaders in that they're the ones that are going to be out saying we need feed bulls are starting to think about breeding right and that becomes focus for them which is really advantageous for us because we're wanting to to take advantage of their mindset right now mm -hmm. but they're going to go wherever the cows are going because they're focused on breeding 
cows are not nearly as focused on breeding, they're focused on feed. And so finding good food sources during the time that you're hunting, and it's going to change. It changes from uh, middle of August to middle of September, and it changes again from there until middle of October. So you can show up in an area one day and elk are all over in there, and the next day you show up and they're completely gone, and they aren't within eight miles. You know, they've migrated mm. to, to better feed. So just understanding that feed in a nutshell, you're looking for open ridges, you're looking for big lush meadows um, that have good nutrient rich feed. Uh, so I'm looking for, you know, I, I wouldn't say you want Southwest exposure because a lot of the feeds are going to burn off in that, but more of a South exposure, um, a Northwest exposure, a Southeast exposure mm. are probably going to have good nutrient rich feed in September. So that's why you hear so much about saddles because they're going from bedding to feed exactly so they're going to use the saddles to transition from a north face onto a face that has better feed cool. so you think you know a north face is lush it's got all this vegetation but it's also usually got a canopy that's providing or it's preventing the sun from getting to it and providing the nutrition that the elk need there's a lot of green but it's not the it's not full of nutrients like elk needs so they're going to go seek that out Cool. And so you use a saddle to, you know, as the elk filter through there to go to their feeding area and then water, you know, they're probably going to bed close to water and they're probably going to feed close to water. And What's so you, close for an elk? Oh, that's uh, anywhere from a hundred <laughs> yards to 10 miles. <laughs> you know, it's uh, <laughs> I've chased elk four miles up a mountain before where they're going every single day from feed down in the bottom up to their bedding area. And wow. it really is, we're going to go to where the, the best feed is and they could have bedded you know 200 yards from where that feed was but they know that they're going to be safest up in this bedding area and so they'll travel extreme distances twice mm. a day sometimes to uh, to go to feed and then back to bed wow but if you can find feeding areas uh water and good bedding areas relatively close to each other within half a mile of each other you can kind of triangulate that and say okay Here's an area that's got all three features close together. Here's another area that has all three features close together. And by e-scouting, you can identify six or eight areas that really stand out. And outside of that, there's really not a lot of, of good elk habitat. And so that helps narrow down that needle in the sure. haystack. Yeah, no, that's great, man. Um, all right, well, while, while we're kind of on this terrain thing, you said you want to mention thermals because that was yeah. a big deal. So let's talk about that real quick. So thermals are probably the number one thing that if I say a new elk hunter makes a, a mistake in this area more than any other area or one area that a new elk hunter needs to focus on more than anything else, it's understanding how thermals work. It's understanding how elk use thermals to stay alive. And it is paying attention to thermals every minute you're on the mountain because they change. Okay. And so when we talk about thermals, thermals are different than wind. Wind is a, a directional thing that can be caused, you know, from a storm coming in, you've got directional winds. So, you know, for a whitetail hunter, you're probably used to, you've got winds out of the east today. So I'm going to set this stand because it's poised to allow me to take advantage of what the wind's doing. We still have that out west, but we also have diurnal thermals. So the, the thermals change, the air changes temperature twice a day mm -hmm. to the point where it changes direction. And so without any kind of a, a directional wind, you just have thermals. And in the morning, the sun's hitting the hillside, you know, say nine o'clock, the sun's hitting the hillside, the ground temperature's warming up, it's warming the air and hot air rises. So now you mm -hmm. get these thermals that are moving up the mountain, up the slope. And so elk know that and mm -hmm. they use their noses to stay alive. So when they're, when the thermals are moving up the mountain, you'll very rarely find an elk moving up the mountain because it's moving with the thermals. It has no protection for what's in front of it. So elk are going to move up the mountain when the thermals are coming down, which means when the ground is cool, pulling the cool draft down the mountain which is so, perfect because they're going out to feed while the wind's coming in their nose right so typically they're what they're from gonna, bedding up to the other side well typically they're going to go from bedding down the mountain okay so what we'll start in the morning first thing in the morning at daylight you've got thermals coming down the mountain coming down mm -hmm. the ridges the elk are going to be in the lower parts so they're going to be down in the meadows down lower where they've spent the night feeding okay. and about 
you know, sometime between daylight and say nine o'clock, whenever the, just think about when the sun comes out and you're like hunting in the morning, it's like, oh, that sun feels so good. You're getting pretty close to a transition, a thermal transition. So sure. 8.30, 9 o'clock, 9.30, it's going to depend. But uh, the elk are going to start moving up the mountain while the thermals are coming down. So they've got wind in their nose. They can smell any danger that's up in front of them. Gotcha. And they're on the move going up the hill. So they aren't as worried about something tracking them from behind. They're moving up the mountain. They get to their bedding area, which again, halfway up the mountain, three quarters way up the mountain, there's a bench. They get to that. And the timing that they use to get there is not coincidence. They get there at that thermal transition. So oh, wow. any danger that has been following them up the mountain, now all of a sudden the wind switches, thermals come up the mountain, they smell it and they're like, there's danger here. We've got to vacate. That's cool. So they use thermals to stay alive. And then in the afternoon, you know, thermals are coming up all day. They're laying in their bedding area, smelling any danger that's approaching from downwind of them. They've got either an open hillside above them where the cows are laying there watching the open hillside to see if any danger's coming down or just a nasty thicket of brush that they're going to hear anything as it tries to approach. All day long, they're in that protected pocket. And then in the afternoon, while the thermals are still coming up, they get up, start milling around, start moving down the ridge, smelling any danger that's down in the bottom below mm. them. They get down to the bottom at that thermal transition again, right when it changes any scent that's behind them of danger, they're going to smell it and be alerted to it. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. So understanding just that little thing and how elk move we don't want to be behind an elk going up the mountain, which is what 90% of hunters do. They get on the ridge, the elk's bugling, it's moving up the mountain to its bedding area. They're right behind it, chasing, chasing, chasing. And all of a sudden it gets to its bedding area, the thermal switch, and the game's over. Yeah. So in that scenario, you want to like go this way, book it up the mountain, and then come back down on top of them. So not even that. So <laughs> no. that 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 is better than following them up the mountain. But even better than that is getting off to the side of them, oh. parallel them as they're going up the mountain. And then once they get to their bedding area, you want to be on the same level as them parallel to them. Mm. Because then you can move across side hill to them. And as you're moving across side hill, there's so many uh, benefits to that. If you're above them and you're trying to call an elk in, it can be tough. An elk doesn't like to come up a steep hill to a, to a challenge. Uh, if you're below him, an elk's going to come to a certain point to where he can see down the hill, and he's not going to come down any lower until he sees an elk. So it can be hard to pull an elk straight up a hill or straight down a hill. And okay. then the big part is is the thermals. If a thermal changes, so if it you know a a cloud goes in front of the sun, and the hillside now has been full sun, and all of a sudden a cloud goes in front of it doesn't have that full sun, it can cool enough to actually change the thermal in the middle of the day. Just okay. for, wow might be three minutes, might be wow. five seconds, but <laughs> thermals will switch. And when they do, it's 180 degrees. It's either thermals are either going straight up the hill or straight down. Hmm. So if you're coming in from below it and you get one of those thermal switches, the elk can smell you. If you're coming in from above it, same thing. But if you're coming in from the side and the thermal switch, you're perpendicular to that. And the chances of that elk smelling you are minimized drastically. Okay. So you got them coming up to the... I'm just trying to visualize this in my head. So <laughs> you, you kind of located some elk. They're moving up the mountain in the morning yep. to go back to bedding. And you're going to want to approach side hill and kind of call in as you go to kind of keep uh, keep tabs on where they're at and maybe pull one towards you a little bit. Yep. So typically Basically. I'll wait. Yeah, I'll wait until they get to their bedding area rather than getting aggressive while they're on the move. That's so hard to do because a bull is focused on the cows. And if you're trying to harass him while the cows are on the move, he's very rarely going to turn and leave his cows and come into you because the cows, they don't care. They're moving to the bedding area and yeah. he knows if he leaves them and comes to you and tangles up in a fight there or whatever, he's letting those cows get distanced ahead of him. Yeah. Another bull could come in and steal them. You know, there's so much going on there. It's hard to get a bull to leave his cows. So uh, just, um, I'm tracking with you, yep. but let's say, okay, you, you identify this, this ridge that you like with the, it's got good bedding and the bench and everything. Are you watching all this unfold from across the Canyon and glassing <laughs> him? Or are you on top of his mountain? Uh, it depends. Ideally okay. you want to be parallel with him. So he's moving up a ridge. You don't want to be on that same ridge. You want to be 300 yards, 400 yards, 500 yards across from him 
on a parallel ridge that's moving up to that same area. And you just want to be keeping tabs vocally with him. So right. a lot of times they'll bugle on their own and you don't need to do anything other than just keep moving up, keep moving up, keep moving up. But a lot of times they don't make a sound unless they're engaged. So you've got a cow call, give them a reason to bugle, bugle back. But you're to on them. the same side of like the canyon as him. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Same side of the canyon, just across on a on a adjacent ridge that's separated by a small draw. Like on a separate finger or something. Exactly. Okay. Cool. Yep. And usually those fingers come together, you know, yeah. close to probably where they're going to bed. Yeah. So you're moving, you know, as you're moving up the hill, you are getting closer to him slightly, but you don't want to get ahead of him or fall below him. Okay. But like when you start, I guess, I guess when you start off, you're, you're starting like the morning across the canyon from him, looking at the ridge you like. Sometimes. The bedding area. Sometimes, sometimes yeah. we'll start, uh, you know, I like to start in the bottoms in the morning because the thermals okay. are coming down. If I start on top and I happen to get above an elk, uh, he's going to smell me before yeah. you know, I, even, I even pinpoint him or locate him. So I like to start in the bottoms in the mornings, work my way up the ridges. Then about the time those thermals change, I want to be on a main ridge so I can start traveling up that main ridge, calling down on both sides into the gotcha. little pockets on both okay. sides. Cool. Because I'm just so trained to like, and, and still my understanding is still so, you know, basic that um, I'm trained to like, you know, you get to the glassing spot first thing, but it sounds like you want to start down low and kind of trail up, you know, next to the herd kind of, yeah. deal with, especially with archery elk, I guess. Yeah. And that's what I'm going to say. If, if it's during September when the elk are calling, I very rarely use optics. Uh, and it's going to depend on the terrain, you know, the area you're hunting. If you're hunting open stuff in New Mexico, it's going to be completely different than hunting, you know, northwest Montana. Right. You, you, just, you might not even need binoculars in a lot of areas that you hunt in the west. But at the same time, if you're hunting you know, Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, places like that, where it's more pinion juniper, you're going to use your binoculars a lot more to, to find. For sure. So glassing points do become important. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, this is good, man. Um, so you're the calling guy. I gotta, I gotta talk about calling. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, for me, um, yeah, I don't know how to call. Um, a lot of guys probably don't. I mean, I could, I can sort of blow a cow, but I lost my O-ring this year, unfortunately. <laughs> but, um, um, but anyway, I guess what would be your, and, and I know some guys like, like a Brian Barney, he's, he's like, he like barely calls. He's yeah. like a spot and stalk guy. Um, I hunted when, when we hunted with Dan, he was calling a fair amount, um, and doing some like night bugling to try to locate bulls and stuff like that. So I guess just from a broad perspective, what's kind of your philosophy on calling? And then maybe where would you point a beginner, um, as far as like kind of the basics you should know and, and maybe even down to like certain types of calls to, to look at. Yeah. So calling is, I think, probably one of the most overwhelming things for a new hunter, especially somebody that's from oh, like back it. east. Yeah. I feel it. And it's just like, <laughs> I've got to learn to call. I've got to be good with calls. I've got to understand what calls to make. I've got to learn all these different calls. And my philosophy is completely opposite. It is keep it simple. Mm. Elk, elk are simple-minded animals. Don't worry about learning a language. You know, don't worry about oh, what did that elk just say? I can't just respond with any call. I've got to learn what call to give him. That's yeah. I don't, I don't subscribe to that. You know, my my experience has led me to believe that elk communicate through emotion, and mm. just like a human, you know, if you're upset with your children, you raise your voice to let them know. You don't, yeah, I mean, that, that's a very broad stroke that we're no, painting with. But if you're talking to an elk and you want to fire him up, you've got to scream at him. You know, you've got to put some emotion into it. If uh, you're trying to convince him that you're a cow that's ready to be bred, you have to communicate like a cow that's ready to be bred. And, it, you know, it can't just be uh, this generic sound. It's yeah. got to be a, but the good news is it's really easy to learn. And so don't overwhelm yourself with, with understanding elk language, learn to make just a couple basic, simple sounds. Once you learn to make those, learn how to apply some emotion to it. So okay. a basic cow call, you know, 95% of what you're going to use when you're trying to appeal to an elk's desire to breed 
is just going to be a regular cow call. Hey, there's an elk here. Well, she's a female and it's breeding season. She probably needs to be bred. So I'm a bull. I'm going to bring her into my harem for a couple of weeks. I mean, it's, a, it's that simple. Their thinking mm -hmm. is there's a cow there. I need to go and, and match up with that cow. So just learn a simple cow call. When it okay. comes to bugling, I'll learn, or, you know, I'll, I'll use a location bugle to find elk, you know, rather than glassing for elk, I'm using a location bugle, broadcasting it out there, hoping another elk responds. And they just use that to communicate that, hey, I'm an elk, I'm up on this ridge, anybody else out there? Yeah. A bull answers, yeah, I'm over here. Doesn't mean anything more than that, other than, hey, there's two of us here in this canyon. So and would that, that be like... <clears throat> more of a like less less of a challenging totally. bugle so it's like so you know you might even have a, like a little guy instead of getting scared off by it he's going to respond i'm assuming yeah. um there's nothing threatening about it there's no emotion in it it's just two or three notes that just go up you hit that high bugle note hold it for a little bit come down and then listen and what yeah. you're really trying to do is just paint that whole canvas out there in front of you with that sound. So you just yeah. want the sound to hit everything in front of you and echo mm -hmm. out there and then listen for a, for a response. Yeah. Then once you get a response, the goal is to get in close because when you're communicating with elk, your communication is so much more effective, the closer you get. So you want to be, you know, you might hear an elk bugle a mile away. You're not going to probably call that bull in from a mile away. You've got to right. get inside probably two or 300 yards before you actually set up and start using calling tactics to bring that elk in. Mm -hmm. So location bugle is to find him so that you can move in and get close. Okay. And then the last one is the challenge bugle. And it's very similar to that location bugle as far as the, the cadence, the mechanics, all of those things, you know, a couple notes hit the high note, but what you're doing with the challenge bugle is you're putting emotion in it. You're letting that elk know, I want to fight. And, <laughs> you know, if you want to start a fight with a human, you don't just sit back from across the street and say, hey, you're not very strong looking. <laughs> yeah, you know, I get you. I get you, you get right in that guy's face and you insult his girlfriend and you insult <laughs> his, you know, his yeah. biceps, whatever it is, and you scream at him and you're almost out of control. He has to decide right then, am I going to turn and run or am I going to swing? Yeah. And elk are the same. You don't give them a chance to make a decision. There's a natural response that there's a trigger that you can trip that an elk loses control of its decision making. And it's a natural response. I was just challenged in close range. I've got these cows here I need to protect. I can run or I can fight. I'm fighting. And you yeah. hear them breaking trees as they're coming down the hill to fight. And that's why it's just a, a natural instinct to go and protect what they have. Nice. Okay. So um, I know like, you know, more you know more advanced guys and stuff really like the the diaphragms and stuff like that um for beginners there's kind of some like i would call them maybe like cheater type calls yep. <laughs> that you can get um that would make it pretty easy um how do you feel about those don't waste your time learn to use a diaphragm and it's okay. not again it's very overwhelming when you put a diaphragm call in you're like i cannot make this sound like an elk but if you break it down into simple steps, it's really easy to learn how to use a diaphragm call and be effective at those simple cow calls, location bugle, and the challenge bugle. So when don't you waste your time. Just go straight for the diaphragm. Go straight for the diaphragms. There's <laughs> they sound so that many. much better? Or? Not only that, but they provide you with hands-free opportunity mm. to vocalize. So you can be at full draw on cow call. You know, If you're trying to use a little squeeze me call or a, a bite <laughs> read call, you yeah. can't do that when you're at full draw. And so learning to, to call with a diaphragm has a lot of benefits. Uh, the realism, the versatility, all of those. And they aren't as hard as, as a lot of people make them. Okay. Do you have recommendations for calls? Uh, I don't. That's just, I mean, it's that would be like um, boots. You know, everybody's foot yeah. is different. Okay. So it's like, this boot's the best one for me. And somebody else puts it on like... This is horrible. It pinches my gotcha. toes and my heels sliding all over. Yeah. Um, so you just, you've got to pick, I would say pick four or five completely different. I would even say from different manufacturers because there's yeah. differences in frames and different things that are used, but just pick four or five and 
put them in and try them and find the one that works. I've done so many seminars and, and worked in call booths for so long. People come up and like, that's ah, not for me. I, I can't use a diaphragm. And I'm like, why not? And they're like, well, you know, I've tried and I gag on it or I tried and I can't even make sounds with it. I'm like, well, show me your diaphragm. And they pull out a, a triple latex turkey diaphragm. And I'm like, well, yeah, nobody can make elk sounds with that. Try this one. And they put it in and they're like, holy cow, I'm actually a decent elk caller. I thought I couldn't call it all. And so it's important to find the one that fits you and, okay. uh, you know, start with one that's probably a single latex with a lighter latex. And that's going to okay. be the easiest to manipulate from there. And yeah. then from there, okay, find so the one that, that For you beginners, can single latex, light latex. Yeah. And you always okay. want to stick with single latex. I mean, there's, there's a few people that make double or even triple latex calls but you want to manipulate that call. It's not like a turkey where you're just these sudden bursts of air that you can hammer on it. I mean, you can really, and you want to get that raspy sound. With an elk call, you want controlled air across that latex and you don't want any breaks in it. You want it to really, you know, the sound to roll as you're going from high to low. Yeah. And when you get a double latex in there, when you get to that high note and you start coming back down, you're going to break every time. I mean, it's hard not mm. to, not to break. So Single latex is easiest to manipulate and control. Uh, it's easiest to, to start making sounds on if you're a new caller. Okay. And then if you are cool. a turkey caller, forget everything you've learned about <laughs> using a diaphragm to call turkeys because it's completely different. Okay. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't do that either. So I'm starting as a clean slate. So maybe Excellent. that's good. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> well, cool, man. Well, um, man, I could definitely talk to you for like three more hours, but. I'm not going to do that. Um, and you're busy. I'm busy. So I really appreciate your time. Um, this has been great. Love to maybe, maybe we can squeeze in another one sometime. Uh, if I draw my tag or maybe after or something, but, uh, it's been fun catching up with you and the time flew by. So I appreciate you, man. Absolutely. Likewise. No, I'd love to, uh, you draw that tag, let me know. And we'll, uh, we'll talk some more specifics and get into more detail yeah. for sure. That'd be great. So um, where can folks uh, find um, your content and even like check out Elk 101 if they're interested in kind of learning more? Yeah. So elk101.com is the website. Uh, we've got all the normal social media. We'd mentioned Destination Elk is our elk hunting video series that we release on YouTube every year. Um, so that's our YouTube channel. Social media, it's all just at Elk 101. Um, so check out the website, elk101.com. We have an online course that walks you through every aspect of elk hunting. Okay. It's the University of Elk Hunting online course, and it's part of uh, outdoor class. If you've heard of outdoor class. Yep. Oh yeah. Um, so the University of Elk Hunting, the entire course is now inside uh, outdoor class. Oh, which wow. You, okay. You can just go to outdoorclass.com and sign up there. And if you use the promo code elk101, it'll save you 20 bucks. Nice. Okay. Cool, man. Well, that's, I didn't know that, um, you put it all onto outdoor class. So that's, that's really cool. Um, yeah, yeah I already feel like just in this brief conversation, I already feel like I know a little bit more about <laughs> at least, at least doing some e-scouting and, uh, um, so yeah, man, I really appreciate your time. Um, this has been great. And, um, yeah, I'll maybe uh, when I find out about that tag, I'll, uh, shoot you a message and maybe we can link up for another one or something if you got time. Be awesome. I'd look forward to it. All right, man. Appreciate your time. Likewise. Thanks, Hunter.